Well, if you've got your uh, Bibles there, let's uh, open at uh, Titus, Titus chapter 1. And uh, in particular, we're going to be looking at verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 to 9 this morning. But uh, we'll start uh, from verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God, our Saviour. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone. And as I directed you to appoint elders in every town, An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he'll be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. For there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. It's necessary to silence them. They're ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. One of your own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. In some ways, it's, it's a fairly heavy passage. And uh, we're just going to be focusing on verses 5 to 9. And as I said to someone uh, this morning, uh, when you work your way through a book, uh, you can't actually choose the topics. It's God who chooses the topics. And uh, so this morning from verses 5 to 9, we're going to be looking at uh, a model of uh, church leadership and the character of that leadership uh, and, and the role of church leadership. Now, this isn't the only passage in the Bible that talks about that, but it does give us some pretty uh, helpful words, some pretty serious words about it. And I, I think it's a beautiful thing as I've been thinking about it, that this was a letter from Paul to Titus for all the churches there on Crete. And God is a very personal God. He's written this letter as just as much as it was to Crete. It's a letter to us and to our situation where we are. And so let's first of all uh, have a look at verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. And uh, when the Bible, you may not have come across this term elders before or else it sounds a bit uh, weird to you. I know it did to me. But uh, really that's the, the biblical, the Bible term for, uh, for leaders within the church that God uh, is, uh, is setting up and building. And so he left uh, Titus uh, in Crete. Paul was on his missionary journeys and he left uh, Titus there to complete the work that had begun so that you might put in order what remained. And uh, it's just a helpful thing for us to remember that uh, we haven't yet arrived. We're still on the way. There is a work that's yet to be completed. 
And uh, we all of us need to keep praying that this work that God intends for us as a church, that we all need to be involved in setting right what's left undone and completing what is, uh, what is working. You know, Paul wrote to, um, in Colossians, he, uh, he says that his, his whole aim in Colossians 1 was to present every person mature in Christ. And for that purpose, he was labouring day and night by the power that God uh, gave him. And, and it's a critical work. Uh, I know for some of you, you're following our church uh, Bible reading pattern. We've been reading through Nehemiah. And um, Nehemiah wants to uh, build the walls. God's given him this job to build the walls of Jerusalem. And, uh, and he just gets one distraction after another. And they keep coming at him to try and uh, distract him from the work. And he says there in Nehemiah 6, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. And, uh, and I think God would say to us as a church, as we press on to maturity, don't get distracted. There are so many things that can distract us from what God wants us to do. And that's really the role of the leadership within the church to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So Titus uh, is is told by Paul to appoint elders. And uh, really that's a pattern of leadership that we start to see in the the New Testament. Uh, It's not meant to be a great hierarchy with a, a sort of a dictator uh, up the top. There's not intended to be a focus on status or, or power and control, but to a point in each church, a group of elders who can provide leadership to the church. Um, just as Paul and Barnabas had done on their mission trips in, uh, in Acts uh, 14, it says when they had appointed elders for them in every church, and they committed them uh, to the Lord. So the reason I left you in Crete was so that you could appoint elders, that you could set up a leadership structure for the church. And you'd say, well, couldn't he have just done that and then taken Titus with him? But I think underneath it all was the issue is that appointing elders is not intended to be a quick fix situation. He had to leave Titus behind so that he could assess people in each church to get the right people in place. As, uh, as Paul wrote to Timothy, an elder mustn't be a new convert or he might become conceited. He must have a good reputation with outsiders. And in 1 Timothy 5, he says, don't be too quick to appoint elders to, to lay hands on anyone as an elder and and so we have a process as a church where we don't just immediately appoint someone as an elder we want to work with people we want to see what people are like and that leads us in I guess to the next uh, issue it's not only a model of church leadership of a group of elders providing that leadership, but it's the, the character of, uh, of church leadership. Uh, many years ago, I, I listened to a series of messages. Um, a man shared on the kind of person that God is looking for, and he talked about a person who's got a heart for God and a heart for others, and a, a spirit of excellence, and a, a servant heart. And it all sprang from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, where he says, Our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. You know how we lived among you for your benefit. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you. And the, it's one of the great tragedies when church leadership is not based on the character of the person. But it's a quick fix situation or it's the person who's got the most influence 
or it, it's the person who's succeeded the most in business. And we lose sight of the importance of the kind of, the kind of men we prove to be among you, not just appearances. That's why Titus had to stay behind to really assess people, to get the right leadership in place. And uh, first of all, and I guess it's, it's an overarching quality, is, is blameless. An elder must be blameless. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but blameless is not sinless. I mean, I'd like to be able to come to you and, uh, and say uh, blameless means I haven't got any sin. But uh, you just uh, ask Ruth and you'll find out the true, uh, the true story. And, but, what I, but what I want to say about blameless is I believe God is saying that when we look at eldership, there is a life, not that hasn't done anything wrong, but there's a life of transparency and a willingness to acknowledge shortcomings, to, to, to confess sin. To put it right. Another way of saying it, which um, is, is well respected, in Acts 6.3, when they chose the deacons, it says, and so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected. There's, there's a recognition that there's an honesty and an openness and, and heading in the right direction in these lives. But it's not just a reputation in the, in the church um, in 1 Timothy 3, he must have a good reputation amongst outsiders. And uh, when we look at eldership, it's, it's not just how a person operates within the church, but if you went to an elder's neighbour, what would they say? Do they hear them, you know, out of control anger, abusing their children? Do they... Do they get any help at all from their neighbour? Uh, what about the colleagues at work? Um, you know, what, how do they look on this person? How do they see them? I, I think that's what Paul is saying when he talks about blameless. Not so much that they've never done anything wrong, but they're open. And, and, and they're, they're heading in the right direction that God is calling them for their lives. And they're, they're not arrogant or proud, hot-tempered, a bully. You know, Paul goes on to talk about some of these things that we just can't cover this morning. But, but you know, sometimes I think actually non-Christians can assess the character of a Christian more than Christians can. You know, they, they haven't... They haven't come with a lot of, uh, oh, well, it doesn't really matter about that. They just see it straight. And that's why Paul has to say in the qualities of an elder, it's not just how they appear at church, it's, it's how they appear everywhere, in their neighbourhood, at, at, at work and, and so on. Um, so that's, that's really, I guess, the overarching um, idea of this, of good repute, because the danger is then if, if someone's appointed as an elder and, uh, and there's all sorts of issues, people look on and the light is not shining of, of the church as it should be in our, in our community. So then he, he goes on to talk about an elder uh, must be uh, the, the husband of one wife. And... Uh, Churches can vary in terms of how they uh, interpret this, you know, whether it's uh, elders have to be married, but, uh, but then we look at, say, Paul or um, uh, even Jesus was not married and yet fulfilled the qualifications, so we don't necessarily think that, that really Paul was looking at that as having to be married uh, or having to have, not to have many wives uh, either. Um, I think what he was, what we think, what what he was really getting at is, and the word literally means a one woman man. That here is here is a man who is committed and faithful to his wife, and uh, and is sexually pure, and if he's not married, that again that he is pure. 
in this whole area of, uh, of relationships. And uh, so I, I think if we come back to this idea of, of faithfulness, that there is a seriousness about their marriage relationship. Um, let me give you just an, another example. Uh, we were at a work function, function uh, many years ago. Um, it was many years ago because I'm retired now. But, um, but I, my wife uh, was there, you know, Ruth was there, and, um, and she came along and I introduced her to one of the men, one of the senior men in the office. And, uh, and they chatted and afterwards she said to me um, on the way home, Oh, he's a bit slimy, isn't he? He's a bit of a flatterer. Uh, Ruth sort of tells it pretty straight. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, he's the sort of, um, you know, can't keep his hands to himself kind of person. And, and that's really, I, I think, what Paul is getting at is there is a seriousness about the marriage relationship, a faithfulness, a commitment. You're a one-woman man. And, and that, I, I'm not sort of having a go at people giving you a hug or whatever, but I'm just saying, you, you know, there is, I think you can sense it when a person is committed to their wife as, 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 the, only, as the only woman in their lives. And, and the, the, the problem is, in a sense, when you appoint someone as an elder, it's a bit like a marriage ceremony. A marriage ceremony doesn't change you in itself. You know, people, when you think about marriage, you want to have a pretty reasonable idea about a person and what they're like because the ceremony is not going to change them. Now, we're all growing, but it's the same with becoming an elder. It's not like, it's not like being ordained as a as a priest or you know or set into this uh, structure on a certain position it's about a life you know the kind of life that we lived among you and that's why in a sense elders people can eld without being elders you know we can put so much emphasis on this external title instead of actually thinking People can be such a blessing and an encouragement and quip each other without being an elder. And, and that's the very sort of person we want to appoint as elders because, in a sense, they're already working in that direction in, the, in their lives. And, uh, and so we, we need to assess people where they are. You know, Jesus faced a religious system that unfortunately is like so many of our churches. In, in Matthew 23, uh, you know, he, Jesus had to say about the scribes and the Pharisees, um, do whatever they tell you and, and observe it, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they preach, what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. They love the place of honour at banquets and so on. But you have one teacher and you're all brothers and sisters. And there's always a danger that an elder can set himself above the congregation. But we only have one master, one Lord, and we are all brothers and sisters. And we're all accountable. An elder should never get into a position where they're not accountable to the other elders and, and to the church. And it's very sad when we see that happen in, in some churches. Well, that's, uh, that's almost enough for this morning. But uh, let's, uh, let's talk about equally important is an elder leading his family. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. And in 1 Timothy 3, uh, it says, uh, if a man doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Because God's church is a household, uh, a family. And, uh, and again, churches would have 
some different views on this. Some would say, well, if, a, um, if their children are not, uh, are not believers, then a person can't be an elder. But yet, you, what about when they're very young and are still growing into it? And I, I think our, our view on this is that we see it, the children are under control in the sense that it's a beautiful family life because there are going to be storms. There's, there's going to be difficulties. Um, there's going to be times when we just don't know what to do. You know, um, uh, God gave Ruth and I five children and, um, you know, sometimes you just had no idea what to do. Uh, but God gives grace and God helps. And uh, I think sometimes too we can distort things um you know i guess um there's a verse in proverbs 22 6 train up the child in the way they should go and when he's old he will not depart from it and sometimes i think people can take that as a promise right if i do the training then uh, this child will come to the lord and, and come to believe and uh, and yet we have many families with godly parents that uh, the children have gone off the rails and I, I think part of what we're learning Ruth and I are learning to under, understand is the importance of listening and also recognizing it's training up in the amplified it says training up a child in the way he should go in keeping with his individual gift or event it's really coming to grips with what is God's calling upon their life. Because the danger is we can sort of want to control our children and say they've got to end up in this particular way. Instead of helping them to fulfill what is God's calling uh, upon their lives. Um, you know, in Ephesians uh, 6, it talks about children obey your parents in the Lord, which, which is right. But then we can often forget to go on to the next uh, verse, verse for uh, fathers don't irritate or provoke your children to anger. Don't exasperate them to resentment, but rear them tenderly in the training and discipline and counsel and admonition of the Lord. And, uh, and so often they're, they're, can our children look on and see an hypocrisy in our lives are we learning to listen to them now i'm not wanting to take away at all from the authority of parents but it has to be done in a tender way and and more and more i think we're learning to listen to listen to our children to listen to what god is saying to us and to them you know why do children go off the rails and I read a thing uh, recently of um, the children can grow up in a Christian environment but have we really helped them with their faith can as, as this uh, fellow said um, uh, can their faith bear the weight of the issues they're going to face in real life and we've just got to be very careful that we, that they, that they can come to us and say anything, and we don't recoil in shock and horror, even though we'd like to sometimes, but that we can learn to listen, and help them and help their faith to bear the weight of, uh, because God can help them to bear the weight of some of the issues they're going to face in their lives, and we want that to be for them their personal faith in Jesus not just our tradition but but their personal faith so we come to verse 7 as an overseer of God's household he must be blameless not arrogant not hop tempered an overseer is just another term for an elder but it, it recognizes that um, when he says not arrogant, it recognises that an elder sees that the church is God's household. It's not his own empire. 
It's, it's God's household. And so he's not the owner. An elder is a, a manager, not an owner. And I'm sure you've been in many businesses where someone owns the business. Well, they've got the right to do whatever they want in the business. But when they're a manager, they're a steward. The Bible talks about being stewards or managers. And so an elder acknowledges that everyone belongs to God, not to him. They're not for him to control. God's given him a role, which we'll touch on later, but we're not to be arrogant. And there's always a danger of wanting to control. Uh, and, and often that control is established through a hot temper. And it's a good question to ask of any church is there a spirit of fear within that church? Because if there's a spirit of fear because the elders have got hot tempers and wanting to control and, and make it exactly their way, it's, it's very wrong. It's, it should never be as the church says. James writes, My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for human anger doesn't accomplish God's righteousness. And we worship a God who, by his grace, is very slow to anger. And we've experienced that in our own lives. He's slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Not a bully. A bully uses people up. It's all about what we can get out of people. And Jesus actually says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And, and, and so gentleness, gentleness values people. Gentleness is not weak, but it values people. And if there's one thing I think, you know, that you could pray for the elders is that we'll learn to listen and understand where people are so that we can help them and encourage them in the most effective way and not just make assumptions about uh, where people are. Not an excessive drinker. Um, there must have been a particular problem in that culture because uh, in chapter 2 he says the older women are not to be slaves to excessive drinking. And I think, again, his, his heart is, is not so much uh, the alcohol as the enslavement to it. And that's really what uh, has to be in our characters. We have to keep asking, am I enslaved to anything? Not just alcohol, not, not just uh, drugs, but there are so many things we can be enslaved to. And, uh, and, and it's the same with money not greedy for money. You know, we can be enslaved to money. And I'm old enough now to have seen people who have given their lives to money. And, and even quite wealthy people, and they just can't give up. You'd think uh, if I was in, I'd, I'd look at them sometimes and think, well, if I was in their shoes, I'd just stop, you know, and, uh, and, and get on and enjoy my life. But they can't. They're enslaved to it. And, uh, and you sort of see the following verses. He says, when you get people as elders who are greedy for money, it says they're ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. And, and so to become an elder, it's not that we're never going to be tempted by money or whatever, but is... Am I enslaved to making money? Is that what I'm giving my life to? So, hospitality. And, uh, you know, a while ago Don helped us to see that hospitality is inviting people into your life. I thought that was a beautiful phrase. How God wants us to grow in this whole area of inviting people into our lives. And, and not just people who can pay us back or invite us back, but that we learn to give to those who can't necessarily pay us back. 
loving what is good. Jesus went about doing good, it says in Acts 10. And, uh, and I was uh, thinking about this uh, during the week. As, a, as uh, quite a young Christian, um, the uh, man who was helping me, he got me to memorise two verses from Titus. And one was Titus 3, 5. He saved us uh, not by works of righteousness. So our salvation is, always, is never because of what we have done, always because of what Jesus has done. But then Titus 3.8, which in a sense almost sounds contradictory, but he says, the saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. But notice even when he says insisting on good works, it's always to those who have believed. Believe always comes first. Our salvation is never because of our good works, but he saved us in order that we can start to live a life that loves what is good. Well, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, uh, you'll have to talk about those in your discipleship groups. We can't cover everything today. But I just want to say that holiness is only possible by the Holy Spirit. Holiness is both a resting in what God has done for us, but also day by day, it's a daily discipline of feeding on his word. We do reap what we sow and I don't want to give the impression that I mean holiness is 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 a beautiful life and again we've had the wrong impression of holiness that true holiness is really beautiful because it's God's life within us his life that we're living and and part of this whole plurality of elders is that we are accountable to each other. Uh, we, we never get to a point in our church life where we're independent, whether that's as elders, uh, whether that's amongst each other. But we can help each other and support each other. So there's a model of church leadership, appointing a plurality of elders. There's a character, a character of openness, of transparency, the life that, is, that can be observed and seen, a life of integrity. And then finally, in verse 9, uh, the role of church leadership, holding to the faithful message as taught, so that it able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. And we just saw how, as we go on from into verses 10 and 11, here are people that are ruining whole households. And uh, the elders, uh, along with us all, have to see and be discerning as to various teaching that comes in, as to what is influencing people's lives, that we might help people and take a stand against what is going to ruin whole households. Holding on to the faithful word what is trustworthy and uh, one of the key roles of the elders is to hold on to grasp hold of God's word and so that then God's word becomes the basis of everything we do and 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 that's what we want to teach to the next generation that they'll grow up excited about the bible stories and start to see that God is faithful that he always will keep his promises. And I remember years ago, I think I might have told you this before, that something that meant a lot to me was there was a missionary to China called, uh, called Hudson Taylor and he trusted God for all these other missionaries to go and someone said to him, you know, I just admire your faith. And he said, um, it's not so much my faith but it's my little faith in a great God, a great God who is faithful, who always keeps his promises. 
So we want to encourage you to press on and, and to believe that God is faithful. He'll guide you and, and lead you. And, and let me share with you from Acts 17, 11, where Paul had gone on to Berea in his missionary trip. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures. They asked about the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Paul was not threatened by the, the, the congregation, the, the family, asking him questions about what he shared. And that's true leadership. True leadership wants to establish everyone in the Bible. And as people ask questions, not to be threatened as though, what do you mean? You, you know, I, didn't I tell you last week about this? But no, to be open that you all must feel free to ask questions about these things and, and to learn and, and to comment and, and, and talk in your discipleship groups, to come and talk with the elders and so on. That we, we, that's really what we want to see. So I guess we've seen something of the model of, of ch true church leadership, a plurality of elders with a character that's right in their home life, in their work life, and their role is to grasp onto and, and hold on to God's word and, and to be able to proclaim it and, and share it. Who is adequate for these things? It's the grace of God in, in all our lives. And uh, particularly as we come around the Lord's table, let's take that verse from Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And we invite all who have come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour to join with us around the table and remember that he saved us not with our own works. We had nothing to bring to him but according to his mercy. Let's thank him for his mercy.